The introduction and proliferation of nuclear weapons is a predominant theme of the Cold War. Given their potential destructive capability, extra care and caution was taken with them as they spread through arsenals around the world. However, like with anything, accidents still happened, including some of them getting lost. I'm your host David, and today we are going to look at the first such incident, the loss of a Mark IV nuclear bomb during the crash of B-36B serial number 4492075 in, in February of 1950 off the coast of British Columbia, Canada. This is the Cold War. Many of you may not be aware of this, but my family background comes largely from Scotland, right from the Highlands, so I feel a connection to the land of my ancestors. And what better way to reaffirm this connection than to not only own land there, but claim a noble title by using the sponsor of this video, Established Titles. You can buy a miniature plot of Scottish land, a square foot of your very own, on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland, and by then being a landowner, you can officially change your name to Laird or Lady. Use your new title on credit cards, plane tickets, or even your dating profile. And best of all, with each order, a tree gets planted by charities like One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future, helping to preserve picturesque woodlands and biodiversity worldwide. And the first 200 people purchasing a title pack using our link will be effectively near my own. Join now and let's create our own little Cold War kingdom. Established Titles makes an amazing last minute gift and is actually running a massive sale right now. Plus, if you use the code the Cold War, you get an additional 10% off. Go to EstablishedTitles.com slash the Cold War to get your gifts and help support the channel. The expression Broken Arrow is not just the title of an alright 1996 John Travolta and Christian Slater film, but is also the term used by the United States military to refer to the loss, theft, or inadvertent detonation of a nuclear weapon. Since 1950, there have been over 30 such reported incidents by the US Armed Forces. Most of these accidents happened with nuclear weapons in the care of the United States Air Force, although to be fair, we should clarify that this is largely the result of so many weapons being in their care, and not because the USAF was more negligent in any way. The nature of the delivery platforms also played a big factor in this. An airplane crash is far more likely than a submarine disaster based on number of mission hours, etc. But we're getting away from our topic. The first Broken Arrow incident occurred in the early morning hours of February 14, 1950 during a B-36 flight off the coast of British Columbia. The US Air Force Convair B-36B Peacemaker, serial number 449075, assigned to the 7th Bombardment Wing Heavy based at Carswell Air Force Base at Fort Worth, Texas, was on a training flight between Eelson Air Force Base near Fairbanks, Alaska and Carswell Air Force Base. The flight was designed to practice real-world flight conditions, including carrying a Mark IV nuclear bomb. The bomb itself, similar in design to the Fat Man bomb that had been dropped on the Japanese city of Nagasaki, weighed in at over 10,000 pounds, that's over 4,900 kilos, and so changed the flight characteristics of the aircraft, which is why the practice flight was necessary. The bomb itself, it's important to note, was a real bomb, but didn't have the nuclear core installed in it, just a practice core. For those who may not be aware, early nuclear weapons did not have sealed pits, where the nuclear material was completely encased in a protective metal shell and lived inside the weapon full time, but rather an open pit, one that was kept in a storage device called a birdcage and would be inserted into the weapon by an onboard crew member, the weaponeer, during the bombing run. The flight we are talking about today, by all records, did not have a plutonium core on board. The bomb did, however, have about 5,000 pounds of high explosives, the compressive trigger used to initiate the nuclear reaction. Now, before we get into the details of the ill-fated flight of B-36B-075, let's talk a little bit about the B-36 itself. The B-36 was a whole other level of aircraft from its predecessor, the B-29. The largest piston-engine combat aircraft put into service, 162 feet long with a 230-foot wingspan and a standard crew of 13 men, its design began in 1941, before America's entry into the Second World War. 
Its entire concept was to be a bomber capable of intercontinental attack and able to deliver enormous payloads from the United States against European targets and still be able to return to base. The first B-36 was unveiled in August of 1945 and did not make its first flight until a year later in 1946. Initially powered by six piston engines in pusher configuration, the B-36 was underpowered from the outset given the weight of the atomic payloads it was by then being asked to carry. To offset this, by 1949, four J-47 turbojet engines were added, primarily used to provide enough thrust at takeoff and then during attack runs. This upgrade was introduced in the new B-36D models being built and was then retroactively added to B-36Bs, but Aircraft 075 was not upgraded with the additional power plants by the time of the February 1950 flight. The flight plan that 075 was supposed to fly was to take off from Ilsen Air Force Base in Alaska, fly south parallel to the Alaska Panhandle and British Columbia coast, then east to Fort Peck, Montana, at which point the aircraft would turn southwest to fly to Southern California before turning back northwards to conduct a practice bombing run against its target, San Francisco. With this complete, the B-36 would turn east to complete its almost 5,600 mile, almost 9,000 kilometer flight back at its home base at Carswell Air Force Base in Texas. At no point in the flight plan was the aircraft supposed to cross into Canadian airspace. The flight plan itself was designed to simulate length of time flown with specific legs and specific turns that would be used in the event of a nuclear strike against the Soviet Union as envisioned by Operation Dropshot, the US nuclear war plan that had been introduced only the year before in 1949. The aircraft, under the command of Captain Harold Berry, took off from Eelson Air Force Base late in the day on February 13th with a crew of 17, including Captain Berry. Not long after takeoff, as the aircraft was making its way south, they encountered bad weather. It had been minus 40 degrees Celsius and Fahrenheit on the ground at Eelson, and the temperature only dropped as they climbed to altitude. The combination of precipitation and cold began to impact the operation of the aircraft as ice began to build on the wings. In order to compensate for the weather conditions, more power was applied to the engines, and then seven hours into the flight, just after midnight on the 14th of February, the problems began. Three of the engines caught fire and began shooting flames. Captain Barry shut down the three engines in order to extinguish the fires, but the B-36 was incapable of operating with only the three remaining engines, especially given the degraded flight performance resulting from the weather and ice conditions. The decision was made to abandon the aircraft, but there was still the matter of the Mark IV nuclear bomb in the bomb bay of the aircraft. The plane could not be allowed to crash with the bomb still intact in the event that enemy forces were able to recover any of the technology involving US nuclear secrets. In testimony given at the Secret Board of Inquiry after the crash, Captain Barry gave the following statement of events. Quote, we were losing altitude quite rapidly, in excess of 500 feet a minute, and I asked the radar operator to give me a heading to take me out over water. The aircraft at this point was northwest of the British Columbia town of Bella Bella on Campbell Island to the west of Haida Gwaii. Barry's testimony continued, quote, We kept our rapid rate of descent and we got out over the water just about 9,000 feet and the co-pilot hit the salvo switch and at first nothing happened. So he hit it again and this time it opened. The co-pilot of 075 described the jettisoning of the bomb in a 1998 interview. As soon as we were safely over the sea, we dropped the bomb. It was set to airburst at 3,000 feet. We were at 8,000 feet when the bomb exploded, so we could see the flash as it exploded. This type of testimony of seeing the bomb explode was repeated and consistent in all testimony given of the crash, something that will be important in the aftermath of the crash. With the bomb now released, Captain Barry turned his focus to trying to ensure the survival of his crew, knowing that a landing Knowing that a landing in the icy water of the inside passage would mean almost certain death for all on board, a course back towards land was set. Barry's testimony continued. The radar operator gave me a heading to take me back over land. The engineer gave me emergency power to try and hold our altitude. We still descended quite rapidly, and by the time we got over land, we were at 5,000 feet. So I rang the alarm bell and told them to leave. 
The crew, who had been preparing to evacuate the aircraft, bailed out over the rugged terrain of Princess Royal Island. Barry, in his final action on board the doomed aircraft, set the autopilot to take the plane out over the open ocean to crash. What happened next with B-36075 is still the subject of conjecture. The last testimony given, which involves witnessing the aircraft, was again by the co-pilot, who in 1998 described his experience after bailing out. As I jumped, I rolled over so that I could see the plane pass over me before my chute opened. I saw a brilliant blue-white streamer of fire trailing one engine for as far back as the tail of the plane. I thought the fire had to be from the magnesium heat exchange on that engine. The aircraft crew, in communication with Strategic Air Command Headquarters at Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska, had declared a mayday situation and that the aircraft was going down. Within minutes, Operation Bricks was launched, spearheaded by the Royal Canadian Air Force. What followed was one of the largest search and rescue operations in North American history, with over 40 aircraft actively involved in searching for the crew and, possibly more importantly, the aircraft and its possible nuclear cargo. This was the first broken arrow, an accident involving a missing nuclear weapon. The extensive search for the crew found 12 survivors and continued to search for any signs of wreckage, but after weeks of searching, nothing had been found and the aircraft and its cargo were deemed lost at sea. The Board of Inquiry concluded that ice buildup on the carburetor intakes likely led to the engine fires and the subsequent crash. Of the 17 men on board, 12 had been rescued and survived, while five members of the crew died and their bodies never recovered. The dead included the first four men to bail out, and it is presumed that as they descended, they were blown back towards open water and died of hypothermia, as none of the crew were wearing exposure suits at the time. The fifth man who died was the mission's weaponeer, Captain Theodore Schreier, who would have been one of the last men to jump. In that 1998 interview, the flight's co-pilot said, quote, I pointed out to the other co-pilot, Captain Schreier, that he had his flotation vest on over his parachute. At this time, he, Barry, and I were the last ones on the plane. Captain Schreier was hurriedly removing his vest when Barry ordered me out. Barry exited after me, I never saw Schreier jump, and he is one of the missing men. No one knows if he did or did not jump except Barry, and he is now deceased. Now, this may seem like an innocuous detail, except it plays into the mystery of what happened next. The B-36, on fire, flew off crewless into the night and was presumed to have crashed into the sea. Except three years later in 1953, during a search and rescue operation for a missing oil prospector, the Royal Canadian Air Force discovered the wreckage of a crashed B-36 on the slope of Mount Colgat in the British Columbia interior. This is a remote and isolated spot in the BC interior, about 50 miles east of the Alaskan border, almost due east of the towns of Stewart, BC and Hyder, Alaska. The USAF almost immediately launched an investigation and three expeditions were launched starting in September of 1953 to reach the crash site. Each of the expeditions failed to reach the site and as winter set in, attempts had to be postponed until the spring of 1954. It was only then, through an almost Herculean effort, that a small team reached the site. It not only confirmed that the crash was B-36-2075, but it spent nine days collecting sensitive equipment to be taken out or destroying equipment that couldn't be taken out. Explosives were used to wreck what was left, and the fires that were started by the main blast resulted in the melting of portions of the fuselage. Importantly, no evidence of the bomb being present in the wreck was ever found. There was a rumor that human remains were found at the crash site, but this has never been confirmed. With this done, it was time for questions to be asked. How did the aircraft, which was supposed to have crashed in the open water of the Pacific, come to rest on a mountainside almost 300 miles away? And these were valid questions to be asked, given that there was a nuclear weapon on board the aircraft when the incident occurred. Several theories have emerged. The first, and most likely, is that after the crew had bailed out of the aircraft, the ice that had formed on the wing at higher altitude broke off, and without the weight of the bomb, the three remaining engines had enough power to provide lift and keep the aircraft aloft. 
A possible problem with the autopilot, either mechanical or human when it was set, resulted in the aircraft continuing inland where it crashed into the slope of Mount Colligan. The other major theory that has been proposed centers on Captain Theodore Schreier, the same Captain Schreier who nobody saw bail out from the aircraft. Schreier was a pilot himself, and the theory is that after the crew bailed out, he remained on board and took control of the aircraft himself. He then piloted the aircraft until losing control when the aircraft crashed. The issue with this theory is that the only reason why anyone would likely try to save the aircraft is that the nuclear payload was still on board. It would also mean that human remains would likely have been found at the crash site. As there was no evidence of either of these things, it is unlikely that this was the course of events. The aircraft wreckage remained largely undisturbed for over 40 years until the Canadian Department of National Defence conducted a site survey to assess any environmental impact. The results showed that no long-term damage had been caused and, most importantly, radiation levels at the site and surrounding area were all deemed to be normal. The site is now a protected site, a designation making it illegal to remove any items from the area. And that is the story of the first American Broken Arrow. While it was the first, it was not the last, with other, more serious incidents happening at sites around the world, including at Thule in Greenland, Goldsboro, North Carolina, Sidi Slimani in Morocco, and Palomares in Spain. These, and dozens of others, involved the United States Air Force, but there were also Broken Arrow incidents involving the US Navy, including lost submarines. As for the Soviet Union, although there are confirmed instances of lost nuclear submarines, there is no official list of how many Soviet nuclear weapons incidents may have occurred throughout the period of the Cold War. We hope you've enjoyed this episode, and to make sure you don't miss our future work, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and have inserted the plutonium core into the bell button to ensure you get a notification. Please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash thecoldwar or through YouTube membership. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com. This is The Cold War Channel, and as we think about The Cold War, I will leave you with the words of JFK. In the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's future, and we are all mortal.